Okay, hello everyone. Let's talk about the origins of World War II. Here is the reading and here are the key terms for today. I'll leave a note up in the cards for the online version of this textbook. There aren't many key terms for this lecture. In many ways, it's more conceptual and it's very much about world history, although we will touch upon the attacks on Pearl Harbor at the end. And here are the guiding questions for today. So we're going to examine quite a few global conflicts in the 1930s, most specifically. And then we're also going to evaluate the extent to which World War II was a war for a good cause. And this is also a question that we can continue to examine when we finish up World War II in subsequent lectures. So in any event, let's talk about what's going on in the Pacific first. Broadly, before we really zero in, World War II was accelerated because of the global threat to democracy. So in the 1930s, there were militaristic authoritarian regimes in various places abroad, most specifically Japan, Italy, and Germany. And this just generally caused a threat to peace throughout the rest of the world. So in Asia specifically, the 1930s is a period of Japanese aggression. Firstly, Japan took over the region of Manchuria and in eventually invaded other parts of China. And so here's Manchuria here. Um, ultimately, this fighting just broadly between Japan and China would claim the lives of about 35 million people. In Manchuria specifically, Japan created a colony, which they called Manchukuo, and they formally detached Manchukuo from China during this period. And many Manchus suffered harsh conditions. They were forced to undertake manual labor under Japanese control and countless died and were buried in mass graves, which makes it very difficult to have a very accurate death tally during this period. Ultimately, Manchuria was restored to China after the end of World War II. Because of this aggression, the League of Nations demanded that Japan return Manchukuo to China, and Japan ultimately responded by just withdrawing entirely from the League of Nations. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, was engaged in a brutal internal conflict with the Kuomintang Party, led by Chiang Kai-shek. So this all is taking place within a major, uh, major global conflict, um, not only between Japan and China, but there's also a civil war taking place within China. In 1937, the rape of Nanking took place. This was when Imperial Japan invaded the region of Nanking and committed mass murder and mass rape and there were up to 300,000 casualties in that event alone. Uh, but Japanese military records were destroyed, so it is difficult to get an accurate death count there as well. It's sort of one country's word against another. Um, the Japanese invasion of China did cause Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek to engage in a temporary ceasefire, but they did resume their fighting at the end of World War II. And despite the publicity of ongoing events in Asia, the American public opinion at this time was largely in support of continued isolationism. Okay, let's move on to Europe. In Italy, they are uh, starting to colonize Europe. They did not really successfully establish any colonies prior to World War I, and so they were attempting to rectify that. And so they colonize and invade Ethiopia and Eritrea, which was a greater region that was referred to as Abyssinia at the time. And approximately 275,000 Ethiopians and Eritreans were killed during this period. And Italy also invaded Libya and Albania. Uh, as far as Germany is concerned, Hitler was the newly elected German chancellor. He was elected in 1933, and he moved quickly to suppress leftist groups like communists, censor the press, and he repudiated, repudiated the Treaty of Versailles and just the general reparations that Germany was paying to the Allied forces after World War I in a speech that he delivered in 1933. And in 1936, Hitler joined forces with Mussolini to support the fascist in the Spanish Civil War. And that, uh, that agreement was against the communist Spanish Republican Party. And Western European powers watched nervously as Germany began to remilitarize. They were anxious that the peace plans within the Versailles Treaty and the League of Nations might unravel, which ultimately they of course do. And Hitler was an aggressive nationalist who dreamt of uniting Europe's German people together in one nation. He believed in the need for Lebensraum, which is German for living space to accomplish this. And so he turns his sights on uh, other regions, mostly to the East. So aggression against Czechoslovakia threatened to force Britain and France into some sort of war with Germany. And then Germany annexed the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia in 1935. And Britain and France ultimately actually agreed to this annexation without Czechoslovakia's input. 
that was because they were threatened by Germany. It wasn't because they were just in agreement with this. They did not actively allow Germany to annex this region. Um, and ultimately what Germany did after that was they move aggressively throughout the rest of Czechoslovakia and then they turn their sights towards Poland. So uh, the Nuremberg Laws also are important for us to be aware of. Um, they were a series of laws that restricted citizenship rights for Jews in the region. They forbade intermarriage between uh, Jewish and uh, non-Jewish Germans. And they also forbade Jews from working in certain jobs like in the government and teaching. And from November 9th to 10th in 1938 was the Night of the Broken Glass, also known as Kristallnacht. And that was a massive coordinated attack on Jews throughout the Third Reich in Germany. The bottom right image on this slide is showing the fire department in the Ober-Romstadt region, um, or Ober-Romstadt, I think it's a neighborhood, forgive me. Um, and ultimately what we see here is that this fire department is working to um, stop a fire. The building that you see that's on fire is a synagogue and they are hosing off the surrounding buildings. So they're trying to stop the fire from spreading, but they're making no attempt to stop the synagogue itself from burning. In 1936, the Olympics took place in Berlin and the Nuremberg laws were um, enforced after that. And Hitler was trying to use the 1936 Olympics to outdo the Olympics four years prior that took place in Los Angeles. Hitler tried to forbid Jewish athletes from participating in these Olympic games, but he ultimately gave in after there were threats of boycott from various different countries. The upper right image on this slide is showing a runner carrying the Olympic torch at the opening ceremonies in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. So you see that juxtaposed in front of these Nazi banners. So this was, of course, something that the whole world watched, and it was very alarming for them to look at Hitler's power and just the aggressive nationalism that was on display in Germany as of 1936. Um, Germany and the USSR signed a secret agreement before World War II called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And what that did was that promised to split Poland between them, and it guaranteed non-aggression between both of these countries in exchange. And Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, and the entire country fell to the Nazis just three weeks later because of the use of German lightning warfare, also known as Blitzkrieg, and that was essentially the use of tanks and planes and motorized infantry to just completely obliterate the enemy's defenses. And Germany then turned its sights towards Western Europe with their sights set on France and Britain. So at this point, again, the United States was largely isolationist in nature. In the mid 1930s, many Americans concluded that the entry into World War I had been a mistake. And so they wanted to do all that was possible to prevent entangling themselves into what increasingly seemed likely to be a new war. College students oftentimes protested any, any type of aggression abroad, not super surprising. This happens no matter what generation, at least in the United States. In 1935, Congress passed a series of neutrality acts to limit the sale of munitions to countries that were at war abroad. And also Congress forbade trade interactions with belligerent nations such as Italy. So it's sort of like a version of economic sanctions. We see that frequently today. For example, sanctions against Russia after invading Ukraine. Prominent Americans urged what they called an America First policy to, pr to promote non-intervention abroad. The America First Committee became the largest anti-war organization in American history, peaking at about 800,000 members, but it ultimately dissolved three days after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. And President Roosevelt promoted military preparedness despite little national support. So his speech calling the United States the arsenal of democracy due to its mass production of munitions to aid the Allies was emphasizing that the United States should help regions abroad help allies and try to prevent war if at all possible but try not to actively engage in the military conflict directly so that's their stance that's a government stance at this point uh, again public opinion is not so sure whether or not any military intervention is a good idea so back to europe about half of france fell to the nazis in 1940 and then hitler set his sights on britain 
The portion of France that remained in French control was called Vichy France, and there was a debate, historically still is, as to whether or not Vichy France operated as a puppet state in collaboration with Nazi Germany or if they had their own independent political agenda. But in any case, Vichy France was an authoritarian, a xenophobic, and uh, authoritarian, xenophobic, and uh, anti-Semitic state. So um, this is just an interesting thing to point out. I remember when I studied this in European history, my teacher essentially said it was a puppet state and then just left it at that. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, in any event, in Britain, the Battle of Britain, also known as the Blitz, was where the Nazis used their air force uh, called the Luftwaffe. And it pounded the British Royal Air Force. And this also caused President Roosevelt to push for increased military expenditures to help the British, because they were, of course, one of the most important American allies in the 20th century. And the Blitz entailed heavy shelling of cities and the civilians within them. And the hope was, at least the German hope, of course, was to crush the British will to fight. But ultimately, uh, Britain never fell to the Nazis. The Blitz ended in 1941, and Germany launched its full-on invasion of the USSR at that point, which was called Operation Barbarossa, and there will be more on that later. 1940 was an election year, and Fre President Roosevelt argued that military preparedness was key for hemispheric defense, so he tried to put it in this greater global context to again try to avoid alarming the American public that if they voted for FDR for a third term, that that would lead the U.S. into war. But FDR did win a third term, and this is unprecedented. This is the only time ever in U.S. history that the same person is elected president for three times in a row. And um, this does expand American involvement abroad. It does create a security zone in much of the Atlantic, and it also paves the way for lend-lease legislation to be passed by Congress, and also it reinstituted a military draft. So we see that war is very much on the horizon by 1940. And what the lend-lease program was, was where the United States supplied the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, China, and France, along with other allied nations with military material, they shipped approximately $50 million worth of supplies to these nations. And then just again, broadly, FDR started increasingly meeting with global leaders such as the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and together they drafted what was called the Atlantic Charter, which was a statement of war goals such as freedom from fear, want, and tyranny. And in some ways, it's comparable to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Sort of, again, what should the world look like after this war is over? Okay, so what led to the attacks on Pearl Harbor, which ultimately bring the United States into World War II? So Japan was threatening to seize European Asian colonies. You re might remember uh, areas such as the spheres of influence within China. Uh, and so in response, at least from the American perspective, FDR cut off trade with Japan, and most notably, they issue an oil embargo and blockade against Japan. And this is very effective given that about 90% of Japan's oil was imported at this point. The United States also demanded that Japan withdraw from China, and ultimately a combination of this oil embargo and also the demands placed by the United States on China lead the Japanese to launch a surprise attack on the naval base um, at Pearl Harbor on the island of Hawa Oahu on December 7th, 1941. And in response, the very next day, the United States declared war on Japan. And then a few days later, on December 11th, they also declared war on Germany and Italy. So that's what led the United States to get involved in the war. We'll talk about the remainder of the war in a few extra videos. We'll talk about the end of it militarily, and we'll also talk about what the war looks like on the home front. So hopefully this video answered these questions. This one kind of broadly, I didn't really directly answer it, but we can consider the extent to which the United States military preparedness is attempting to do what they see as what was good. And also the previous period of American isolationism as something that the American public thought was the right thing to do. So obviously that's a very subjective question. In any event, we'll keep going with World War II on the home front and we'll also look at the end of World War II in some future videos. Thanks so much for watching and see you soon.